My name is Ujwal and welcome to this chapter video walkthrough for chapter 4.2 on aggregating images for time series. Uh, at this point, you have been learning about image collections and how to use the filter map and reduce techniques to work with those time series. This chapter is a <clears throat> great application of those filter map and reduce concepts and will you learn how to use them to build uh, aggregate time series. So the outline for today is we'll do a brief overview. I have one slide on uh, what the whole chapter covers. Uh, there's a bit of theory about the data set that we are using and why we need to aggregate to a different time period than the original time period that it comes with. And then we'll dive into Earth Engine. I'll be coding live and I'll be telling, walking you through each line of code and building the whole script uh, together. So the goal for this chapter is to teach you how to aggregate time series. When you work with image collections, uh, each data set is produced at a different time interval. Uh, if you talk about optical data, say Landsat or Sentinel, for the Sentinel-2 data set, uh, you get a new image in your region every five days. And you have an image collection for a year, you have one image every five days. But some of your applications may require that you create monthly composites. If you are working on agriculture and you want to uh, create a composite for each season, maybe a growth season, harvest season, et cetera, you want to create a seasonal composite. Now, how do we take your original time series and aggregate it to monthly, seasonal, or maybe yearly uh, intervals? And that's the goal for today. So we'll take an image collection, in this case, uh, precipitation data, and we'll create a monthly precipitation data set out of that. Uh, this chapter also will teach you how to work with dates. Uh, when you're working with Earth Engine, uh, you'll have to do a lot of date manipulations. I'll cover some of the API functions that you can use to make working with dates much easier. And we'll then create a plot, a time series plot to create uh, the time series chart for the aggregated time series. This uh, already assumes that you have worked through other chapters. You know the fundamentals of Earth Engine. Uh, you know how to take an image collection, apply filters through it. Uh, if not, we'll, I'll cover some of the basics, but if you don't understand it and you want to learn more, you can go back to the referred chapters here and uh, cover those videos as well. Uh, well as I mentioned, the chapter 4.0 covers the map reduce concepts and the details of the how to write a function and map that. So uh, we'll take those concepts and apply it here. If you want to recap those concepts, do go back to chapter 4.0 videos and uh, see how uh, what those concepts mean. All right. So let's look at the data set that we'll be using. As I mentioned, uh, you can apply this technique on any data set, whether it be an optical data set, a gridded population data set, a climate data set, the concepts and the code will remain very similar. Uh, today's example is going to be on precipitation data. We'll be using this data set called CHIRPS. This is a data set uh, that is a mix of both satellite observations along with ground data. So CHIRP stand for Climate Hazards Group. This is a group out of UC Berkeley that produces this data set. They use the satellite-based infrared precipitation measurement. So there are satellites with infrared radiometers that measure, uh, give an estimate of how much would be the precipitation on the ground. But that estimate is not always very accurate. And those satellite only sensors uh, sometimes are biased. They don't always uh, uh, kind of agree with the ground sensors. So this data set combines both the satellite data along with the ground station data to produce a much accurate version of a gridded rainfall data. Uh, this is a long time series data. So you have 40 years of rainfall observations available to you. It's a really great data set for time series analysis, trend analysis, and so on. It's a fairly high resolution as far as climate data sets go. This is one of the highest resolution, spatial resolution climate data that is available to you at about 0 0.05 degrees. Uh, its coverage is uh, limited to plus minus 50 degrees. So if you live in Canada, um, you can't use this data set. It doesn't cover uh, that region. But if you live within this plus minus 50 degrees uh, latitude band, then you will have coverage for this region. Uh, the main advantage of this data set is that it's internally consistent. They are all produced using the same algorithm. And so if you want to uh, do a trend analysis, whether the precipitation is increasing, decreasing, uh, what are the trends of that? Uh, this is great for that. It's also great for 
drought monitoring and uh, people use it to compare the, the precipitation in the current season compared to the past season and maybe uh, see if this region might be experiencing drought. The, the data set that you get, if you look at this in Earth Engine or you download this data set, you get a data set that covers five, a five day period. So you have one image where each pixel is the amount of rainfall at that pixel over five days. So each observation is grouped into a five day period that is called Pentard. And this seems like a bit of a strange choice of Thing, uh, of a unit as why do we have data set as Pentard? Uh, this is because Chirps uses some other data sets as input to that algorithm, which are also produced as Pentard. So uh, that's why you get this images, which each image is rainfall every five days. So if you consider each month, each month starts at the first, you have one image from first to the fifth of the month, second image from sixth to the 10th of the month and so on. And so there are, five five day pentards so 25 days and then depending on how long each month is the last pentard is either three four five or six days long and then the pentard would reset at the beginning of each month and that means you have six pentards in each month and you have 12 pentards uh, 12 months in a year so you have 72 images for a given year that's what you get and that's your rainfall uh, data set here So you have, if you look at visually, this is how your images would look like. You have six images for uh, each month and each images represent the five day grouping of rainfall. This data set is not very useful in this form. If you want to analyze rainfall, you may want to aggregate and say, I want to know what's the monthly rainfall. You are generally not interested in rainfall every five days for your application. You might want to compute seasonal rainfall you want to say, I want to know the yearly rainfall for the last 40 years, right? So you have to take this Penta data and somehow aggregate it to monthly, seasonal, or yearly data set. And in our example today, we're going to take this data set and see how we can use map reduce techniques to take this data and transform it into a collection of 12 images, which is the monthly rainfall. So you take your five images, six images for each month, sum it up, sum up all the values at that location and create the monthly rainfall at that pixel. And you have to do this for every month. So we'll start with a collection of 72 images and we'll apply a technique and end up with a collection of 12 images, one for each month. And that's the goal for today. So with that, let's dive into the practical. Uh, this is the link. If you click on this link, it'll add the uh, the Earth Engine GE EDU book repository containing all the code. So I'm going to show you what that looks like. If you already added the repository, you can just go into chapter uh, 4, F4, in uh, chapter F4.2, and you can uh, look at the, the code. The chapter is divided into four checkpoints, uh, and we're going to work through each checkpoint. So I will start from a blank code editor. I'll type and explain the code at the end of the script, you'll have the full script that is the checkpoint D here. All right, so let's start with our data. I'm going to search for chirps. And you can see there are two data sets that come up here for uh, chirps. The Penta data, this is the one that I mentioned. There's also daily data. Uh, the daily data is actually not measured daily. It is a disaggregated version of the Penta data. So the unit, the, the, the algorithm outputs the total five-day rainfall, and you don't really know how much it rained on each of the days. But there are some techniques where you can disaggregate it to the daily data. So if you, for analysis, I would recommend using the Penta data. This is the, the true original data set. This one is uh, only if you really need daily data. So let's start with the Penta data. I'm going to look at, uh, you can look at the description, read about the data. This one has only one band called precipitation, and this is millimeter of precipitation per pentard. That's the unit of the value of the each pixel. Let's import it. And I'm going to rename this variable to be chirps. So this chirps data now contains one image for each pentard for last 40 years. So we will, we don't want to do uh, for all the years, let's just define our start and end dates. So I'm going to define a start date to be 
2019-01-01. So we want to aggregate the rainfall data of time series for 2019. I want to know how much it rained in each month of 2019. Our end date would be end of 2019. In Earth Engine, the way filters work is the filters do not include the last date. That means you always have to have one day uh, ahead of the actual date that you want to end. So uh, we want to end our analysis and on December 31st, 2019. So our end date has to be 2020 01. 0101 01, 01, uh, 2020 is not included in the Earth Engine filters. And now we can filter our data. So we'll just create a variable called year filtered, take our chirps data and apply a date filter. So we'll say filter, and then we'll apply a date filter, EE filter date and start date and date. Let's print it. Uh, there's a shortcut control enter. If you do control enter, you don't have to click the run button manually. I find it very useful where I make some change, do control enter to just look at the, the result. And you can see here, the output says, this is an image collection of 72 images. And as I mentioned, there are six pentards in a month and 12 months in a year. Since we filtered it for one year, we have 72 images. You can see this image. This is an image that starts at 1st January, goes all the way to 6th. This one is the precipitation from 6th to 10th and so on. So now we have the 72 images and uh, this is our original time series. We want to now aggregate it to months. But before we do that, I want to show you some of the date functions that will come in handy as we work on our map reduce concept. If you create your dates like this, this is the date that has been created using string. This date is just text and uh, manipulating text for doing any date processing is very hard. So if you want to manipulate dates in Earth Engine, the preferred way is to create date objects. So to we need to take the string and convert it to a date object. So instead of defining your dates like this, I recommend using the date module to create a date object. If you look at under docs, there is this ee.date module. There are all the date functions. Uh, there's this function ee date from ymd. So this creates a date object from the given year, month, and day. And this is a preferred way so you can create date programmatically. So I will replace my string and I'll say my start date is ee.date. From YMD. You can do control space to autocomplete function names in Earth Engine. And we need to give year. So the year is 2019, the month is one, and day is one. And so now this start date will be 2019, 1st of January. End date. How do we create end date? We can create the end date the same way, 2020, 1, 1, but I have a better way. This will also help us when we write a function to create this time series for uh, all the 12 months. Instead of creating this date manually, we can say the end date is one year after the start date. So there is this function called advance, where you can take a date object and advance that by a particular unit. So here we say, I want to take the start date and call this function advance on it and I want to advance it by one year. So this advance function takes two parameters, delta, how much you want to advance, and in unit, so in what unit you want to advance it in. So I'll say one, comma, and the unit is year. So the end date is now start date advanced by one year. So let's print this. I'm gonna print the start date, I'm gonna print the end date, and you can see my start date is 2019, 1st January. The end date is one year advanced of that. And my filtered collection is the same one. So it's the same thing that we did before, but now we created a date programmatically and advanced it uh, using the advance function and then filtered it. So this is the, uh, the preferred way of working with dates. If you uh, get used to working with this, uh, creating dates and using those in your filters, uh, writing map reduce functions will become much easier and you'll be able to do to create dates uh, ranges uh, programmatically as we'll see in the next section. I want to show you one more thing. If you look at this date, this date is uh, printed as 2019 0101. I want to expand this. 
So it says the date object has this value and this value is this large number. Same with this date, you can see this is the date. The value of the date is this. Now this is called the timestamp. So the dates, uh, when you want to store dates in a database or you want to do some date manipulation, working with strings or uh, strings is very hard. So computers like to work with numbers. They're good at you know, working with numbers. So, the, so a technique commonly used is to store dates as numbers. Now, how do we convert this date to numbers? Well, you convert it to, you take a base year, in this case, 1970 first gen, and you say each date is the number of milliseconds that have passed since the midnight of 1970 first gen. So these are the number of milliseconds that have passed since 1970 0101 uh, to arrive at this date. And if you store this date, the computers can store them easily. You can manipulate those much easily. So these are the timestamp. They are also known as Unix timestamp. And uh, when you are, kind of using dates in Earth Engine and you print stuff, you might see those system colon time start timestamps stored as this milliseconds. So we'll also need to store this timestamp in our image collections when we aggregate. So if you want to store this uh, date, you'll have to convert this into milliseconds. Fortunately, there is a helper function that already exists in your e.date module. So if you take your start date and there's a function called millis, if you call this function millis, this is going to tell you how many milliseconds has passed since 1970-0101. And it will give you the timestamp. Similarly, we can do the uh, end date millis. All right, so this is the end of our section two in the book. Uh, we So far, we've learned how to uh, load the chirps collection, create dates using the e date from YMD function, how to come advance the date using the advance function, and then take those dates and apply the filter. We also learned how to take those uh, dates and convert them to timestamps, which are suitable for storing them as metadata or in a database. Uh, next, we'll learn how to aggregate the time series.